I am, of course, joining you from Optimism Brewing on Capitol, Capitol Hill. I'm the only one here. Otherwise, I got the place to myself. Hopefully, you're all safe at home and enjoying quarantine and isolation. We'll get started in just a moment. For those of you online that aren't familiar with Cascadia Climate Action and Climate Science on Tap, this is a series of events that we hold uh, around the Seattle area uh, where folks can come together to talk about climate science, climate change, and uh, drink good beer. So hopefully you're at home right now with a beer of your own getting ready for a fantastic lineup. We have some great speakers tonight and I will be uh, introducing them in just a few minutes. As I said, we're just waiting for our, our attendees to sign on. The numbers keep crawling up, so I just wanna make sure that folks have a chance to sign in, get comfortable, so we can go ahead and get started. And if you've never been to one of our events before, my name is Sean McDonald. I'm the moderator tonight. Uh, usually the moderator for these events for Cascadia Climate Action for our Climate Science on Tap series. Um, as I said, we usually hold these events around the Seattle area. You should definitely sign up for our mailing list if you haven't already so that you can be kept aware of all of the great events that we hold around the city. Um, Optimism Brewing on Capitol Hill, Peddlers Brewing in Ballard, Flying Bike in Greenwood, lots of great breweries around Seattle and we're always up for talking about climate science. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. As I said, my name is Sean McDonald and I am your host tonight for Cascadia Climate Action's Climate Science on Tap, Climate Change Misinformation, Communicating Facts and Responding to Falsehoods. As, as I said, this is brought to you by CascadiaClimateAction.org. You should definitely check out that website. I'd like to just take a moment just to briefly introduce our panel. We've got John Cook from the Center for Climate Change Communication at George Mason University. John, you wanna say hello? Uh, hi everyone, uh, uh, thanks Sean for inviting me on this panel, looking forward to it. Great, we've got Heidi Roop from the Climate Impacts Group at the University of Washington. Hello, Sean and all, thanks for having me tonight. Great, and we have Jevin West from the Center for an Informed Public at the University of Washington. Hi, Sean, thanks for putting this on. And since this is a panel on misinformation, you did you might wanna tell them how good your photography is back there here pretty soon. <laughs> okay, you're right. I am actually not at Optimism Brewing. I am in my bunker at home. I just happen to have a green screen. So Jevin caught me there. Um, yeah, so as the, as the title, Lutz, we are talking about climate change misinformation. We're going to talk about communicating facts, responding to falsehoods. Uh, we've got this great lineup here tonight. These folks are going to be sharing um, all the information about, uh, about um, uh, climate change misinformation. Um, and uh, I think that probably the best thing for us to do is just to go ahead and get started. Our very first panelist tonight is Jevin West. Oh, I, I'll before I get started with introducing Jevin, I just wanted to go ahead and make sure that you all know that as attendees of this event, you can ask questions of our panelists at any time. Please, you go ahead and uh, type your questions in at this URL, the tinyurl.com questions on tap. Those questions will go directly to our panelists and we'll go ahead and answer those questions during our Q&A. So again, tinyurl.com forward slash questions on tap please, 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 at any time, if you have a question for our panelists, go ahead and uh, submit them to us. We would love to see questions from you at home. All right, so as I said, I'm gonna introduce our first panelist for tonight. Jevin West is an associate professor in the Information School at the University of Washington. He is the co-founder 
of the Data Lab and the director of the new Center for an Informed Public. His research and teaching focus on misinformation in and about science. He develops methods for mining the scientific literature in order to study the origins of disciplines, the social and economic biases that drive these disciplines, and the impact the current publication system has on the health of science. He co-developed a course called Calling BS, or Bullshit, that teaches students how to combat misinformation wrapped in data, figures, and statistics. That course is now being taught at the university, uh, at, at universities around the globe. And so with that, I just wanna welcome Jevin, and I'm gonna turn control over to him so that he can share his work with you. So Jevin, have at it. All right, thanks, thanks, Sean. I, I'm, I'm already looking forward to the day when we can all really be in that brewery and be uh, drinking together. I've been to these science on taps and um, this kind of format, it's, it's so much fun. It's one of my favorite, favorite kind, but we'll do with what we have. So um, what I wanna start with today to get things going is to talk more generally about uh, misinformation, um, to talk about some of the, the general patterns that we see, not just in climate science, but across topics. Like of course, around COVID-19, we're seeing massive volumes of misinformation. And this is the kind of thing um, that, you know, the, the kinds of things that we're seeing around COVID are the kinds of things that we see um, you know, around climate science. So I'm gonna go to there, but I'm having a little difficulty switching slides. Sean, let me try, oh, there we go, it's working. Oh, whoa, slow down there. <laughs> okay, now it's working. All right, so let's just get warmed up. Um, one of the uh, projects that we started with over a year ago with my colleague Carl, Ber Carl Bergstrom in biology, we created a project called Which Face is Real? And this was simply to bring public attention to uh, the kind of technology that's creating what some may have heard of as deep fakes or synthetic media or voice cloning. There is technology now uh, using um, what are called uh, neural nets or adversarial uh, you know, uh, 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 these adversarial algorithms that essentially can play against each other to create photorealistic faces or to create voices that sound like, um, you know, they really are the person and you can put any words you want in them at someone's mouth. So you may have seen some of the Obama videos originally around this project. But the idea is to, is to really make people aware of how good the technology is and, and, and how it you know, makes it harder and harder to tell what's real or not. So what you're looking at here is one face that's actually real, it's a real person. The other one was created with algorithms within minutes. Um, and it's something that you know, pretty much anyone can do and it's scary to even think about that, but one of these images is not real. So look, think in your head, if we were in person, we could raise hands. What I find usually with some of these hard ones is that 50% sometimes think the left one's real, 50% thinks the right, right's real. And I've seen thousands of these, by the way, and I get them wrong all the time myself. So looking at this, place in your head, which one do you think is real? I'll give you the answer in one second. The one on the right is real. Don't feel bad if you thought the one on the red was real, or the one with the red coat on the left was real. It's really hard to tell, and it's getting better and better. The point is, we now live in a world where it, we've got all this great technology, uh, we can, we're connected through this big social web, all sorts of great things that amplify diverse voices that uh, allow for collective action in ways that we've never seen, but it also um, makes for a world um, in which we have to discern truth or, or not truth. It makes it even harder. So that's kind of the world we live. So, um, you know, we have this mission and I say this mission just so um, everyone realizes that for us, it's not just misinformation that we're studying in this center. Um, it's really about improving democratic discourse. Um, and, and I think, you know, to, to, to make collective decisions, we need to promote the kinds of um, uh, environments and the kind of culture that allows us to, to come together and, and, and try to solve difficult problems. So this is our, this is our mission statement. We're, um, we have kind of four pillars. So um, there's a, a pillar, of course, of research. That's sort of our core area. We study misinformation, mostly online, we, but we study it more generally. We study disinformation, which is intentional misinformation. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that maybe today. Um, of course, we have a strong emphasis on education and community engagement, because it doesn't matter how good our research is, if we don't reach out to the public and talk to them, then yeah, I don't, it, it, it doesn't really matter. And then we also uh, have some expertise on the policy side. So Ryan Kahlo, who runs the Tech Policy Lab, University of Washington, helps run the policy arm of the center, 
which um, using like the deep fates exa example, we, uh, we'll, we had conversations in January before COVID happened with policymakers in Olympia around some potentially some laws uh, before elections using deep fakes. The idea behind some of these laws and the ones in California um, and, and very, various other states as well um, was that you can't, you can't create a deep fake of a politician that's misleading 60 days before the election. It's not a perfect law and there's, there's, there's problems with it, of course, but the idea is to, to take this, these issues of synthetic media serious. So, you know, our, our goal, what we're trying to do in this center um, it's really to become a hub for researchers, educators, librarians, policymakers, industry, anyone on, on topics that deal with misinformation, disinformation, to study its flow, where it comes from, how it travels, how it spreads, how it amplifies, how it cascades, but also how it engages with people's values, beliefs, and perspectives. And I think we're going to talk about that a little bit today, which is why I was the first speaker to sort of kind of set the stage on misinformation more generally. And then of course, again, we want this research to turn into action and change. And that's not trivial to do, especially when those values and beliefs can, can really sometimes um, you know, be really hard to overcome. Um, I'll just give you one example. This is from a colleague of mine who's a co-founder of the, the center, Kate Starberg. She's done a lot of super interesting work looking at um, conversations online uh, at, at large scales. And here she was looking at conversations around the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, the ones on the left in the pink color, those are tweets and, uh, and retweets and connections between those individuals that were in support of the Black Lives Movement. Then there's also the one on the right, which is more of the Blue Lives Matter. So it's actually, you, you should say sort of Blue Lives Matter on the right, should actually need to be, I guess, blue to make it more clear. But, um, but the idea here is you kind of have two distinct groups talking about the topic, but with different, um, you know, different perspectives on it. And one thing that was really interesting that she found when she was looking at um, uh, accounts from the IRA, which is the Institute Research Agency um, uh, out of Russia, this is the, the, they've been known to sort of push some disinformation campaigns and Twitter had released a data set that showed that, um, or that, that, that provided those accounts. And so what Kate did is she said, I want to see where they exist. Are they on the left? Are they joining in on the conversation, agitating the conversation on the left or on the right? So kind of like the image I just showed you on the one that was real, uh, which one was real at the very beginning of what I was talking about just about a couple minutes ago. Now I want you to guess, where do you think she found these accounts of people purposely, at least all evidence points to that, trying to um, agitate um, these conversations? And as you'd expect, what you, oh, maybe what you expect, what you, it's, I, I shouldn't assume that, uh, there, cause there's, you could make an argument for any different scenario here is that she found that these IRA accounts were existing um, in both communities. And so that's one thing that we've seen at least around disinformation is that it's not one camp or the other that these individuals and groups are found. They're actually find, found in both groups. It's really, as far as, um, the research community has, and actually more than just the research community, the things that's sort of being established in the field is that, that, that really it's, it's very much about just reducing trust in institutions. Um, and that's something that we're concerned about in the center. And I think more broadly that this idea of institutional trust decreasing across the board, governments, um, media, of course, et cetera, et cetera, uh, you know, universities even, the, 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 there's been several recent studies that came out of the Wellcome Trust and the, the Knight Foundation showing that, and the Gallup, and Gallup polls, et cetera, and the Pew Foundation showing um, this decline in trust. And, and it's that trust that we need to make these large collective decisions. And so we're concerned, and actually even talking about it in the public, talking about to everyone right now, all 137 people online right now, it, it's always concerning that we don't make the problem worse by saying, oh, by the way, there's deep fakes, there's you know, there's a lot of efforts on, by propagandists to, to sort of disrupt the information flow and to, to sort of erode trust in, in, in institutions. And to talk about these things more generally, I think we have to be careful so it doesn't further the problem. So that's one thing that we, we think a lot about. I want to say also that we have a, a strong public uh, engagement program. We have, you know, in the, back in the olden days when we used to go to campus, we brought hundreds of uh, high school students 
um, from rural and urban areas in Washington to come talk about misinformation and media literacy just for a day. And of course, one of the topics we do bring up is, is climate science. And, and one of the things we do also there is try to, still ins try to instill trust in the systems, even though there are flaws and problems. Because a lot of the misinformation that we see on the internet, especially around COVID-19, and I could talk about that ad nauseum since that's what we're doing a lot of work on right now, is that a lot of rumors start with good intentions. I've talked about the, the sort of bad intentions of disinformation campaigns, but there's a lot of, um, a lot of these rumors start with good, good intentions, um, and they just sort of morph like a game of telephone. And that's the kind of thing that we're worried about. Now, there are other efforts too, uh, you know, whole, there's a whole area called agnotology, which is the study of a sort of induced ignorance, cultural um, ignorance into society. And there's, there's lots of efforts um, that are, you know, around climate science in particular, where this applies to. So we talk to the students about these things, just make them aware, um, but also try to instill um, confidence in them. I'm going to, just because of time, I'm going to, um, I'll just quickly say that we've been tracking some of the misinformation around COVID recently, and we've been seeing some really interesting amplification patterns going on. A lot of times it's being driven by broadcast media. So what you're looking at here was a Medium post by an individual who was relatively obscure, um, and he had posted something that was, had a lot of misleading content. It was actually taken down by Twitter, taken down by Medium, but it had been, um, it had been amplified by uh, big media stars, um, in this case, Fox, but we see it on the left and the right. It's not just um, on the right where we see this, but it was amplified. And this individual that was relatively obscure had been just thrown into the spotlight and, 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 and received way more attention than you would normally get given this new environment. And these are the kinds of things that we're seeing often, these sort of S-curve explosions of ideas that are coming from these obscure areas of the internet. And it's the type of thing that we also see with climate science as well. So I'll, just as an example. And also, we are also looking at ways in which um, tech companies are trying to reduce the spread of misinformation. They've said for a long time they can't do anything. Well, around COVID, they're now putting up banners like this. This is a banner. They actually don't have the face mask around the banner. That was just my own little face mask face mask re rendition. But anytime you search coronavirus on Twitter or Facebook and many other platforms, it'll come up with a banner now saying, hey, if you want to <laughs> learn something about coronavirus, go to the CDC, go to the World Health Organization, etc." And what I would love to see from the tech companies is to keep going with this after the coronavirus sort of settles down and we get back to at least semi-normal, that it would be great around other issues, big issues like climate science, for example, where at least um, there would be opportunities to go to these institutions that are trusted institutions, especially in science and academia um, and, and government institutions that study these things full time. So we'll see whether tech companies actually respond this way. So with that, I'm going to end and turn to my uh, fellow panelists uh, and, and, and excited for the, the open conversation. Great. Thank you so much, Jevin, for that. That was fantastic. It was a great uh, introduction to sort of what we're talking about today, this idea of misinformation and very general overview of all the different types of misinformation and the approaches of misinformation out there. Um, again, I just want to remind everyone that if you have questions for any of our pal panelists, Jevin or, or our later panelists as well, you can please go ahead and submit those online using our web form. It's tinyurl.com forward slash questions on tap. Uh, please, please, please submit your questions for our panelists. That will help us during our Q&A. The way that our, our events typically run is we have several short uh, presentations by our panelists, and then we'll open it up, we'll open up the panel to questions from the audience. And so really can't do uh, Q&A without the questions. So please submit your questions online. Our next panelist I'm going to introduce right now is Dr. Heidi Roop. Oh, I'm sorry. My apologies. I'm introducing Dr. John Cook. He's a research assistant professor at the Center for Climate Change Communication at George Mason University, researching cognitive science. In 2007, he founded Skeptical Science, a website which won the 2011 Australian Museum Eureka Prize for the Advancement of Climate Change Knowledge and the 2016 Friend of the Planet Award from the National Center for Science Education. John co-authored and published a number of high-profile textbooks and papers on climate change. And in 2015, he developed a massive open online course uh, 
at the University of Queensland on climate science denial that has received over 25,000 enrollments. His latest book is Cranky Uncle Versus Climate Change, How to Understand and Respond to Climate Science Deniers. Uh, and with that, I would love to give John a big round of applause and turn the mouse clicker over to him. So have it, John. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. All right. So let's see if this works. It works. Okay. So um, uh, I really enjoyed Gavin's talk. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk about the same topic of misinformation, but I'm coming at it from a, a different angle. My discipline is um, psychology and cognitive science. And most of my research has been focused on, on climate change and misinformation about climate change and, and how to, what are different ways that we can respond to it? What are different ways that we can inoculate the public against climate misinformation? But the principles that I've been um, researching and, and applying, uh, and this is one example here of, of uh, just one particular application of uh, inoculation against misinformation, uh, these techniques, I've, uh, over the last month, I've been applying the same techniques to coronavirus misinformation because we're seeing the same patterns, uh, the same techniques of science denial, and, and the same uh, strategies in response are just as applicable. Um, so, so this is an example. Um, there is a bit of a lag. I'll have to adjust for that. Uh, this is a... I'm going to get psyched out by this, I think. Uh, so this is an example that I published uh, just over the, uh, this last week um, of using analogies uh, and uh, inoculation to um, inoculate people against uh, the arg arguments against social distancing. But I'll, I'll get into more detail. I'm kind of jumping ahead of myself here. Okay, so... Um, First, I wanted to talk about uh, some psychological research into how to build public resilience against misinformation. Um, because I think that, um, yeah, I, I mean, it's been really encouraging to see social media platforms like Twitter um, and, and YouTube being quite um, proactive in, in taking down misinformation about, about COVID-19. But this has really been an outlier compared to their past behavior. They've been quite slack in, in proactively responding to misinformation about climate change or vaccination or, or other issues. Uh, and I, I confess, I'm not overly optimistic that they're gonna continue this practice in the future. It'll be great if they do, and I think that we need to put pressure on them to do that. But um, ultimately, I think that, that a really important piece of the puzzle is building public resilience against misinformation. And uh, so I've, uh, I and other researchers have been con uh, have been conducting experiments into how to do this, uh, and I want to look at um, one particular study that was conducted by Sander van der Linden and one of my colleagues at George Mason and some colleagues at, at Yale, who uh, tested what happens when people are exposed to conflicting pieces of information. What they um, looked at in this case was misinformation casting doubt on the scientific consensus about climate change. And the misinformation uh, was this screen here. It was taken verbatim from a website called the Global Warming Petition Project. And the misinformation basically uh, stated that 31,000 science graduates have signed this statement um, claiming that humans aren't disrupting climate. And therefore, there's no scientific consensus on climate change. They also showed them uh, participants in their experiment, uh, this other information, which is uh, the, the fact that there's 97% agreement amongst climate scientists that humans are causing global warming. Uh, and so what they did in this experiment was they showed different groups one or the other pieces of uh, information. So the first bar in this chart here were people who were only shown the 97% consensus information. And what we see here is this a strong positive uh, increase in perceived consensus, but also climate attitudes. So people became more accepting of the reality of global warming and more supportive for climate action. The second bar in this chart shows um, the group who were only shown that misinformation, casting doubt on the consensus. And what we saw there uh, was a decrease in perceived consensus and also a decrease in um, climate attitudes and support for climate policy. Uh, 
But the third group here was shown both. They were shown the fact and the myth. And what we see in this case is the two cancel each other out. And, and this is, um, I think, one of the most dangerous elements of misinformation. In fact, Jevin was talking earlier about how um, these uh, ration bots or this misinformation coming from the IR, IRA um, seed misinformation on both sides of the debate. Uh, and, and that's a really dangerous dynamic because when people see information supporting both sides flying around, if they have no way of resolving the conflict between these two sides, then there's a danger that they just disengage and stop believing either. And that's what they found in this research, that, that people that, um, stopped believing in the fact because of the mere existence of the misinformation. Uh, and so, um, and so what they tried uh, in this experiment was, is it possible to inoculate people before they're shown the misinformation? And this is an excerpt of the inoculating message that they used in the experiment. And what it basically did was it highlighted different ways that the misinformation misled people. Uh, and I'll just, just uh, focus on one part of it. Uh, it explained that the misinformation used this technique of um, basically fake experts, people who convey the impression of expertise, such as people with a science degree, but had no actual relevant uh, expertise in climate science. Because it was anyone with a science degree, it, it included um, graduates of, of computer science degrees or veterinary science or medical science or mechanical engineering, but only 0.1% of those 31,000 had, uh, had actual research experience uh, with climate science. Now, what they found in their experiment was when people were inoculated, um, and, and essentially uh, by inoculation, I mean they were exposed to a weakened form of the misinformation before they were shown the misinformation, then the misinformation um, was, its influence was reduced and the facts were able to have a positive effect again. And so uh, that's, that's the kind of uh, results uh, that they found in this research and I found in my own research that preemptive inoculating and explaining the techniques used to mislead people builds resilience. Uh, it builds immunity so that when they encounter the actual misinformation, they uh, are less likely to get influenced. So what I've been doing in my research um, over the last half decade is exploring, how do you put that into practice? How do you inoculate people? And how do you develop even inoculating messages in the first place? Uh, and so to, to explore that, I began working with some critical thinking philosophers from the University of Queensland, Peter Ellison and David Kinkeed. And we basically developed a methodology for taking a claim, uh, it might be misinformation, it might not, and deconstructing it and analyzing it in order to identify whether there were any misleading um, techniques, whether there were any reasoning fallacies in the claim. And once you are able to identify that, then you can build an inoculating message uh, and disseminate that in order to neutralize the misinformation. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll give you an example, but let me just very briefly go through this, this step by step, because I've found it a really useful um, method for just analyzing or, or um, just uh, interrogating misinformation or potential misinformation. Now, the first step is deconstructing a claim into an argument. And what I mean by an argument is uh, an argument structure has the form of a series of starting assumptions or premises leading to a conclusion. Uh, every argument takes that form. Once you have the premises and the conclusion, then uh, the next thing you can do is check, is this argument logically valid? By which I mean, does the conclusion logically follow from the premises? If all the premises are true, does it automatically follow that the conclusion is true as well? And if it is, if it is logically valid, then you can go on to check whether the premises are true. And if the premises are true, then the claim is true. Um, but if the argument is logically invalid, in other words, if the conclusion doesn't follow from the premises, what you need to do now, and this is actually, I think, one of the most important parts of, of analyzing misinformation, you need to add that uh, it's usually be 
arguments are usually logically invalid because they there's an unstated assumption, there's a hidden premise. If you add that hidden premise that makes this argument valid, logically valid, um, usually what you've done then is you've identified the part of the argument where it actually goes wrong. Uh, I'm getting very theoretical, so it's probably helpful if I actually um, give you an example to make this a little bit more concrete. Um, so, so let's look at the example and my um, Zoom screens are kind of covering up the top part. So let me just move the pictures down a bit so I can see. All right, so what? Um, let's deconstruct that misinformation that I was talking about at the start of the experiment. Um, so the misinformation is the Global Warming Petition Project, which is a list of 31,000 uh, science graduates who've signed this dissenting statement. And the argument is that this proves that there's no scientific consensus that humans are causing global warming. Now, if we, um, if we deconstruct that claim into uh, an argument structure, um, uh, what we see is it has two premises and a conclusion. The first premise is that um, a, a large percentage of science graduates are dissenting against, um, who don't, don't believe that humans are causing global warming. The second assumption or premise is that if a person has a science degree, then they must be an expert in climate change. And the conclusion is that there's no scientific consensus. Now, if both of these premises are true, then it logically follows that the conclusion must be true too. This is a logically valid argument. So then what you need to do is uh, look at the premises, identify whether these premises are true or not. And it turns out that both these premises are false. The first one is false because 31,000 is only a tiny percentage of the total number, the millions of people who have science degrees in the US. Um, and so what this first premise does is commit the fallacy of uh, magnified minority. It's magnifying these 31,000, making them seem like a big number, but it's actually only a tiny fraction of a percent of the total number of science graduates. And the second premise commits the fallacy of fake experts. Just because someone has a science degree doesn't convey expertise in other areas of science that they, they didn't initially study. And so going through this process give, uh, helps you identify uh, these reasoning fallacies. And once you have those, then you can develop them into inoculating messages. Um, let me give another example. Uh, this is a, a statement that was made, I think roughly a month ago uh, at a Fox News town hall. And um, at, that, at this moment in time, uh, the Trump administration were delaying uh, mitigation policies. They were de delaying uh, social distancing measures that was really desperately needed at those early stages to stop the, um, the virus from, from spreading through the community. And this was one of the arguments that, that was given to, to delay um, social distancing. And the argument is basically that COVID-19 was not a serious threat because more people died from the seasonal flu. Uh, and so if we take that claim and we deconstruct it into an argument, basically there's two premises. Now, and these numbers are a little bit out of date, but the, the logic still applies. The first premise is that in the last flu season, around 34,000 people died from the seasonal flu. Uh, the second premise is that, um, and again, this was about a month ago, uh, around 5,000 people had died from COVID-19. and uh, this argument was made um, all the you know around several weeks ago and going further back. So those numbers have changed, but still that dynamic of less deaths from COVID-19 um, than from the seasonal flu. Obviously now I think we're approaching uh, around 50,000 deaths. So this this argument has, has kind of died on the vine, um, but it was it was quite prominent back when we needed to um, be. Uh, uh, doing social distancing measures. And uh, whoops, uh, yeah, so this argument is actually logically invalid. Uh, the conclusion doesn't follow from the premises. Uh, just because um, people uh, had 
less people have died from COVID-19 at that moment in time doesn't necessarily mean that um, measles is more threatening than uh, coronavirus. And so what's the, the extra hidden premise that you need to add to this argument? Um, the hidden assumption in this argument is that the number of COVID-19 deaths will stay less than the number of deaths from the flu. And this premise commits the fallacy of slothful induction, uh, which is coming to a conclusion uh, before considering all the evidence. And the relevant evidence here is that COVID-19 is more infectious than the seasonal flu, and COVID-19 has a higher mortality rate than the seasonal flu. Put these things two together, and um, it, you can, it's, it's a fatal assumption to assume that COVID-19 deaths will stay lower than the seasonal flu. So um, what I've been exploring over the last couple of years since I've done this critical thinking work is, well, how do you, how do you put this into practice? How, how can you take this critical thinking work and communicate it to the public? Uh, and this is actually one way to do it. And we've tested this in research. Um, we've tested deconstructing arguments and identifying the fallacies and, and explaining that to people. Uh, we've also been exploring using analogies to uh, explain the fallacies. Uh, and so here is an example of that same logic, the slothful induction uh, logic in that COVID-19 is less threatening than flu argument, but taking it and applying it into an absurd situation. Because uh, the argument is basically saying, well, right now, in this moment in time, things aren't so bad. So there's no problem, right? and it's ignoring what's coming down the track. Uh, and so taking flawed logic and putting it into extreme absurd situations is a, um, it's a very powerful and compelling way to communicate bad logic and inoculate people against false arguments. We've been testing these two approaches uh, in research uh, here at George Mason. Uh, and so one experiment we um, this, we did this months ago, uh, no, it, was, it was over a year ago. We tested um, some anti-vaxxer misinformation, the, the argument that um, someone got an injection and then suffered a, um, some kind of negative reaction and, and saying, well, the, the vaccination obviously caused um, this, this, these symptoms and, and therefore uh, vaccination is bad. And so we tested either explaining the fact that this argument uh, is mistaking correlation for causation from a um, logical point of view, or we tried showing um, a parallel argument or this um, cartoon analogy as a way of explaining the bad logic. And what we found was both approaches were both roughly equally effective in uh, neutralizing the misinformation, in debunking the myth. But uh, through uh, mediation analysis, we found that they both were effective through different pathways. The um, logical deconstruction was perceived as more credible. And that higher credibility of the debunking was the mediator that made, that made this debunking effective and, um, and helped uh, counter the misinformation. But we found using eye tracking that the uh, cartoon um, uh, received more attention. People looked at the, the humorous analogy for more time. And through mediation analysis, we showed that, that greater attention was the pathway through which it was able to debunk the myth. And so what, what we found is there are different pathways, there are different ways to counter misinformation, but they can work through different pathways as well. So, um, so that, that's, we're continuing to uh, dig into that. Uh, and I'll try to, I'll just very quickly talk about this new research, which has just been approved from the verge of being published probably within a week or so. Uh, and we've been testing two other ways of inoculating people against misinformation because most debunkings are fact-based. They counter the misinformation by explaining facts to people, explaining the science, explaining, giving people information that shows that the myth is wrong. Um, there's less... Uh, research into uh, logic-based corrections, which is explaining the fallacies, explaining the rhetorical techniques in misinformation. So we wanted to compare the two and see which were uh, more effective. Uh, and what we found was um, both 
had both were more effective, or both were effective, but the logic-based correction was um, was more effective than the fact-based. Um, and the reason why, and I, I, I could get into detail during questions if people are interested, was because logic-based corrections worked um, whether they came before or after the misinformation, whereas the fact-based only worked if it came after. If if you explain the facts to people, but then they're shown misinformation, the misinformation cancels out the facts. And so ordering matters when you're giving people facts and, and information. Um, not so much with logic. Logic is more um, robust. And so, so all of this research really uh, points to uh, explaining rhetorical strategies, explaining critical thinking and logic uh, as, a, as a powerful way of building public resilience against misinformation. Uh, I will just finish um, by um, highlighting uh, a taxonomy that uh, I've been developing over the last few years uh, to help uh, give people a framework for understanding fallacies and denial techniques. And it's based on the five techniques of science denial, uh, summarized with the acronym FLEC. Uh, but it's, it, I've been building up over time, adding more uh, techniques and fallacies to the point where it's becoming a bit of a monster at the moment. Um, but it's, it's really crucial to being able to spot uh, misleading techniques. And we're actually developing a smartphone game at the moment that will help people be able to remember all these techniques because there are so many of them. And we're exploring using gamification as a way to get people practicing critical thinking through a fun uh, medium using games uh, and using cartoons and humor. And um, if you want to find out more about that, you can jump onto crankyuncle.com where there's more information about the game and, and this whole this whole uh, line of research into building resilience and using analogies and humor to, to uh, also inoculate people against misinformation. So I might uh, stop there. I feel like I've been talking a long time. Sorry, Sean, if I went too late. That's quite all right. John, actually, I found it really interesting, and I, I'm sure folks at home found it really interesting, too. And in fact, I mean, I started just doing a drinking game since I was by myself. And so every time <laughs> you say climate change, I, I took a drink. So um, maybe folks at home are doing the same thing. Hey, we're not driving anywhere, right? So uh, just as a reminder to folks at home, if you have questions for John or for Jevin or for Heidi, please uh, submit those questions online at our website. Uh, tinyurl.com forward slash questions on tap. We're taking those questions and we will uh, ask those questions during our panel, which will be coming up after our last presenter. Our last presenter that I, I will introduce right now is Dr. Heidi Roop. She's a lead scientist for science communication at the University of Washington Climate Impacts Group and an affiliate assistant professor in the UW Department of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences. She will be joining the faculty of the University of Minnesota in July 2020. Congratulations, Heidi. Thank you. Heidi, comes, uh, Heidi combines climate science research and the science of science communication to connect climate information to decision makers and communities across the Pacific Northwest, U.S., and abroad. Heidi has spent over a decade studying ice, mud, and mountains. She now focuses primarily on moving mountains to achieve climate resilience. And with that, I am going to go ahead and turn over control to you, Heidi, and just give you a round of applause, my own private round of applause. Thank you, Sean. Sure. <laughs> Let's just make sure, I don't know if it's worked yet. Let's see. I think there's a lag in the controls. Still not working. There you go. There we go, all right. Okay, so I'm going to shift gears here a little bit from uh, my other the other panelists who set a great um, foundation um, for zooming in and thinking about what does all this mean in practice? How do we navigate this landscape of misinformation um, to actually advance, say, climate science understanding and importantly, its use so that we can prepare for the changes that we know we've set in motion through releasing greenhouse gases and from human activities. So I have the great privilege of working at the Climate Impacts Group um, with a range of wonderful colleagues with expertise spanning everything from conservation biology to um, political science. And we work across the Pacific Northwest with um, Pacific Northwest thinking specifically about how do we get the right climate science information into the hands of people who wanna use it to inform decision-making that's occurring now that will shape the future. Um, so 
misinformation, as you can imagine, creates a dynamic and ever-evolving landscape that we as scientists um, producing climate science information, hoping to deliver that information to people to use, um, plays a role. And I think we often have it sort of around in the background and, and aren't necessarily always thinking about how it plays into our interactions on the day-to-day -day when we're working with a government agency or a county or a community or a tribe. Um, but it's really, it's sort of the larger landscape that, we plan, that we're navigating as you all are as individuals or as professionals. Um, so hopefully there'll be something in here that's useful for you. And I guess the main point I wanna hit home is that um, despite the misinformation, there are dozens, if not actually thousands of people across the country and the world really working to combat misinformation through building relationships of trust and working collaboratively to really think about what does climate change mean for us in the here and now, and what are the nuances, geographic, political, cultural, um, those nuances and how science and climate science can be applied um, to influence and improve our everyday lives. Um, so this is again, a bit of a switch, but um, really f focusing on these questions of what can we do? What do we plan for? Um, and how do we get the correct information into the hands of the people who are making decisions on our behalf? Often those are elected officials. I'm gonna give you a case study example too. And let's see if this isn't, my slide advancing is still not working. There we go. Okay, I don't know, Sean, did you do that or did I do that? <laughs> All right, so um, the big question then overarching is how do we engage, connect, and establish ground to advance climate science use? Um, and this is a picture of me giving a presentation, um, and this is essentially my face and answer to that question. Um, I don't really know, but we are do a range of work to try to address these questions and to navigate again this evolving landscape of misinformation. So what we do know, and we have been working in our organization to really focus on is that to adapt to climate change, the climate science itself is insufficient. So we even know this from a lot of the research that John has done and his colleagues, that it's not necessarily the facts and the data that matter to move people towards action or towards understanding or combating that misinformation. We know that if we wanna build resilience and that we want people using the accurate information and say addressing the issue of climate change, developing policies and so forth, we need people acting across all sorts of communities and levels of governance, thinking about the ways in which climate change will touch all the facets of our lives, right? It's a threat multiplier. So where does climate change show up? You could look out your window right now and there are probably a dozen places that climate change will be showing up in our communities and in many ways already is. Thinking about the timing of the bud break for, for our cherry blossoms if you, if you live in Seattle. Um, thinking about, I can see the ocean from my window and thinking about how our ocean is changing, how the Puget Sound is changing um, with ocean acidification, ocean warming. Um, so we need to think about and bring information to people to see where all these connections lie because as I'll explain, um, in many in many cases, climate change is perceived as a faraway threat and something that's happening not in our own backyards, where we know as climate scientists that that is not the case. So we, I won't go into this much, but for folks who are interested, feel free to send me an email and we can talk and communicate and also check out the Climate Impacts Group's website. But the way in which we do this is in part to, the way we do our work is um, really, I think, at its heart, a great way to counter misinformation. This isn't necessarily scalable. This isn't something individuals necessarily do, but individuals can participate in this process. And this is that when we think about what science is needed to make smart decisions, we as scientists don't just decide what those things are. We are working in partnership with people, with those very people making decisions, people like you and I living in communities to identify what are the key questions that need answering and can science help answer those questions? So can we generate knowledge together? And I think this is an important ingredient for countering misinformation and getting people the real meaningful science and other knowledge that goes into addressing climate change. I think we as a country in many ways are moving beyond the is climate change real. So seven in 10 Americans uh, think climate change is happening. Um, so the next step is what can we do and how do we get to um, 
a better, brighter future. And so the, the way we do our work is helping to inform that, integrating science into this fabric of what it means to be a prepared community, prepared for environmental changes, but also say changes like we're experiencing right now with the pandemic. So we have these key questions. I won't belabor the point here and to get onto a case study, but we ask the question of what science is needed who do we need to bring together to generate that knowledge? Who is trusted? This is another important factor in communication, particularly around controversial issues. People want to and trust information when it's coming from people they know, family members and others. In this context, it's thinking about who might be communicating science that we generate so that it is trusted um, in, in much the same way that John is doing his research, looking at um, whether people are interested, you know, if it's humor or non-humor, in this way we're thinking about who can be a broker of that knowledge. So the knowledge may exist, but we might not be the one delivering it. Um, I fit a certain different demographic and cultural values, et cetera, and we provide all sorts of biases and I'm part of my community and not every community. And so who is it we can work with and generate knowledge together to actually disseminate information, the correct information further out into the community. Um, and what are the best ways to communicate and share knowledge? And I'll give you an example of this because this is really what I'm focusing on more these days is thinking about how is it we actually share that information, not only who, but across what platforms and what helps people absorb the information that we do generate. Um, so I'm gonna just give you a quick case study. So in all of this sort of theory, I'm gonna just try to hit it home with an example of a project I've been working on most closely right now. And this is thinking about sea level rise in coastal Washington. Um, for those folks who read the news about climate change, we often see headlines like this. Um, sea level rise is an issue that's in the news, I'd say almost daily. <laughs> um, it is an active area of scientific inquiry. It's one of the most interesting questions that we're navigating in the scientific community about the future of climate change. So what will happen to our large ice sheets, um, particularly what will happen in Antarctica because the consequences for our coastlines is significant, uh, but it's an area where we need to do more work. And so research continues to come out. And so we see these headlines much worse than feared, um, sea level rise much faster. So the big questions for sea level rise science are how fast and how much. Um, fortunately, in Washington state, we have uh, new projections of sea level rise that were generated through an incredible collaborative effort um, involving the federal government, state officials, local community governments, and university researchers. Um, and we basically generated information about specific change along Washington's coastline. So we took this global issue and we made it local. What does it mean for a, a segment of coastline in Washington state? And I'll show you what we did with that information. This is why sea level rise and similarly why climate change is a challenge and a challenge to communicate about and a challenge to combat for misinformation. Um, it is hard to connect to because it's driven by change that's happening far away. Not many of us ever get to go to Antarctica. So what happens there might not seem like it's relevant to us. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty attached to certain science. This is particularly true with the high end projections for sea level rise. So those really low probability but high magnitude events. There's a lot of uncertainty around what those numbers are, how big they can actually be. Um, sea level rise is pretty slow moving. Um, and this is additive, it's an issue that's additive to other coastal impacts. So like I said, climate change is a threat multiplier. So it makes some of the things we already experience worse. This is true for sea level rise. It makes things like king tides or storm surge worse because it has risen the level of the water. Um, and each decision, say we're trying to address sea level rise, has its own context. It has its own ability to be vulnerable or not. So risk tolerance is different, whether you're building a wastewater treatment plant on the coastline or a park. Um, and how we prepare for that ranges widely and costs an entirely sort of different amount of money, amounts of money that I can't even comprehend, right? Where um, when we think about how we're gonna adapt our coastlines, there are a range of options that we can choose. And so these are things that all make it difficult to address this issue and very easy for people to disconnect and latch onto information that might make those decisions easier by allowing us to avoid the reality. So we wanna help people navigate the information that exists um, and to sort of tackle this challenge of, of, making, of taking this remote issue and making it feel really local. 
Um, so as I mentioned, there's this Washington Coastal Resilience Project that generated 171 projections um, for 171 locations along Washington's coast. We have projections of sea level rise out to the year 2150. Um, and that, the, the data that were generated were put together in a beautiful report, but the actual data were delivered in 171 spreadsheets that looked like this. Um, these are information rich resources but the communication is lacking because we found that people really struggled with this. And so um, through a project that was funded by Earth Lab and Seattle Public Utilities, we worked with Tableau to create a visualization of all of these data to support technical end users in accessing and using the information that was generated through this project. Um, to do this, we actually worked with the people who would be using this information. So this might look like overwhelming if you never think about sea level rise, but was designed in consultation with the people who are reading those same headlines, but then being asked to make decisions about what those, what the sea level rise will actually mean for critical infrastructure that they're responsible for, say, building, um, safeguarding, etc. And so we work really hard to translate the information and provide it in ways that help it be used so that these become the go-to resources, not the other background noise. So I know we, I want to leave time to make sure there are questions. So I'm just going to bring this again, sort of zoom back out. So we tackle this issue. We have a data rich environment in our organization and we work collaboratively, not only to determine what information we should generate, but also how we deliver that information. We also are working to take information that organizations like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change produce. They produce excellent special reports that synthesize the state of knowledge across the globe but they end up being 1300 page reports, um, which are difficult for everyone to just pick up and grasp and get a handle on the information and understand why it matters to you. So it's really hard to care again about Antarctica if you're worried about how you're gonna get groceries, for example. It's these far away things that are hard to connect to. And so we work really hard and in response to say requests from our governor <laughs> to say, he'll say, okay, that report's great, but what does it mean for my constituents? What does it mean for Washington state? And so we're charged with creating products like this report that just came out in January that synthesizes a special report on the oceans in the cryosphere that was put together by the IPCC. Um, but we took the information that was presented in that report and the information that we've generated to juxtapose this global story against this local story of what is happening in the Pacific Northwest for climate, for our water, and for our frozen parts of our, of our region. Um, and I'm gonna end here, um, and again, to leave people with um, some time for questions, but I just wanna say the reason that we take this information and work so hard to translate it and deliver it and build trust with people and also become a resource, um, is is important but more importantly for the hundred plus of you that are on this call it may feel like well why does this matter i don't work at an organization like this um, some of you might be from abroad but um, many of us here in the u.s are are able to vote um, so speaking to an american audience we live in a democracy where voting um, is important because these the decision makers who get this information are the ones that are making choices on our behalf um, and so we want them getting the correct information. We want them making decisions for us that use the best available science. And so our group works to make that science, but we can't be part of every single conversation about climate change that's happening um, in communities and across the state and the region. And so I encourage you all to check out the information we do have and figure out what pieces of the climate change story resonate with you and matter to you and hit on something that you care about and then communicate that to a family member, to someone in your community, hop on Zoom with someone, write a letter to one of your elected officials, your commissioner, um, the port authority. There are all these places climate change shows up and tell them why you care and direct them to the information that is accurate um, and updated and that is, is basically peer reviewed, unlike much of the misinformation that we get. Um, and I'll just close with, um, I think the piece about climate change communication and information that I find um, resonates. And this is from a colleague, Ed Maybach, who works with John. Um, simple, clear messages repeated often by a variety of trusted voices is the way that we move 
the climate dial. It's how we move forward and we actually start tackling this enormous challenge, even as we navigate the enormous challenge of misinformation. So I will close there. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Heidi, for sharing that. Um, I'm going to go ahead now and ask all of our panelists to um, turn their video on, turn their microphones on. I'm going to stop sharing the screen for a second. I'm going to move us back into our gallery view so that hopefully all of our audience members at home can now see us all. So thank you all for sharing your insights. I, I, I personally learned a lot uh, through all of that. And I want to go ahead and get to our questions now from our audience. Um, I will say we're running just a tiny bit behind. And so hopefully we, we still have another 20 minutes or so for Q&A if folks are, are willing to do that. Um, first and foremost, we've gotten quite a few questions from uh, our audience that have this basic flavor to them. And I'll, I'll go ahead and try to paraphrase all these questions down into one question. Um, do you have suggestions or advice for effectively interacting with that fact-averse swing state MAGA ant or like? Um, and that seems to be a very common theme. And I'm realizing, you know, from what you each said, I think there's, there's pieces there that you can share about how best to interact with these folks. Because I know, Heidi, you mentioned the fact that, that we, we receive information better from people we know and trust. So that's one thing right there. And, and certainly some of, uh, John, your cognitive work, I think is, is really interesting there. So uh, it, anybody can take this and start off with, but, but really, do you have good advice for interacting with that loved one who just fundamentally has different views? I'll jump in because I think there are multiple perspectives on how to answer this. So I'll provide one and I'm sure my, my colleagues have, will have things to add or to, to maybe disagree with me about. But um, I think, Sean, what you said there is really important is it's talking to loved ones or people we care about. Um, I think it's important to start there. There are a reason that we have these relationships and that people are trusting us or wanting to have these conversations. So I think it's really important to think about who it is that you're talking to and finding that common ground. You likely share some similar values. Um, and instead of attack, attacking someone with misinformation or just, you know, or just peppering them with, with your views and, and viewpoints, it's really, I think, about working hard to create dialogue, identifying what are the things that they care about, where are their views coming from, um, much in the same way that if you were listening to a friend rant at you, you would probably have some empathy. You would probably try to see through that rant and identify what it is that's really bothering them. What's at the crux of the rant, um, you know, being wronged in some way. I think when we communicate about climate change, it's, it's similar. Um, and, and trying to see, see maybe where their concern lies or where they feel like the future that they want is maybe threatened by this thing called climate change. Um, and I think we can also lean on information that's available to us from numerous polling and things that happen um, happens across the country through research. There's a lot of it that's very easily accessible. Um, for example, AP Epic produced a poll um, in 2019 that talked about um, what things had the strongest influence on people's um, concern or awareness of climate change. Um, and I find hope in these numbers um, and in these things. And the top four things that change people's views or influence their views about climate change for the American public are extreme events. We see those a lot. Personal observations, which I think is a really important place. How many of us ask our family members, what's the weather like? These are great ways to understand what people are seeing and observing and then connecting those things to climate change. Um, and then the third in that list is arguments supporting climate change. So the fifth or sixth in that list is arguments against climate change. And so I think we have a real opportunity to have rich conversations. So instead of entering the conversation in combative mode, really thinking about having an interpersonal conversation about what we want our future to look like and how climate change will play a role in that. And I know it doesn't always work. I live in a family where I have those family members and I'm a climate scientist. So um, I feel your pain and it's not always easy, but keep going and continue to love your loved ones. 
Great. Anybody else want to chime in? Thank you, Heidi. John, feel free if, you, if you'd like to. Uh, I, okay, I have a few things to say about that. Firstly, um, I similarly have uh, family members. I've had climate conversations with both my father and my father-in-law who both um, uh, you know, were dismissive of climate science. And my father-in-law, I, um, I could get 50 PhDs in climate science denial and I still wouldn't be able to persuade him that, um, that climate change is real. So I think that, that some people are just literally unreachable. Um, with my dad, uh, I tend to get quite frustrated with my dad. And so um, I think that that idea of different pathways uh, applied in his case. One day he just said to me, oh, I, I, um, I accept that global warming is real and, and humans are causing it. And I was like, what? And, and, and this is how I was half up through my PhD and I thought, this is like Jane Goodall. I could, you know, I'm right next to her. I could find out exactly what's going on under the hood. And I casually asked him, so what changed your mind, Dad? And he says, oh, I've always thought this. So I thought, okay, well, um, <laughs> I'm not going to get a straight answer out of him. And, I, and my deconstructing and trying to figure it out from the black box, that is my father, uh, I think what happened was he got solar panels and he started uh, actually getting checks from the um, electric company rather than bills. And I, I think his behaviour changed first and that led to his attitude changing because it doesn't always go from attitude to behaviour. It, it can go in either direction. Um, but, but more generally, from a communication point of view, I think it's important to recognise that there are different, um, different audiences and they all require different strategies. And just in, in, from a really simplistic point of view, I, I think from a climate communication point of view, you can look at three, three different audiences, the dismissives, the undecideds, and the concerned and alarmed. Concerned and alarmed are 57% of the US population. They're already on board with, this, with the science, but many of them aren't active or they don't talk about the issue with their friends and family. So it's not so much about preaching to the choir, but with that audience, it's about activating them and giving them the tools, the actions, the information they need to be able to be more active. With the undecided, that's about 33% of the population, I think. And um, it's, for that group, it is about engaging them, finding a way to, to make, uh, help the disengaged become engaged with the issue and moving them into the concerned group. With the dismissives, they're only 10% of the population. So I often say that um, the most important climate, communica climate communication question isn't how do you change the minds of that 10%. It's more how do you communicate or inoculate the 90% who are at least open to evidence. Uh, and I think if we have limited communication resources, then our time is often better spent uh, with that 90% rather than trying to kind of bang our heads on that brick wall that might be our cranky uncle or our father-in-law. That's great. Jevin, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I was just thinking, John, that maybe your book should have been Cranky Father or Cranky Father-in-Law or so, something like that. <laughs> what a wonderful story. I think Heidi and, and John did a really good job of, of answering that question. I would just add one element, at least one thing that I use when I talk to um, uncles. I have uncles as well. I, I came, I am, I'm from a small town in Idaho and we, we have, uh, you know, I have those discussions actually quite often. And so I actually enjoy those conversations because it gives me a chance to really test out what I talk about. And it's challenging. It is really challenging. And sometimes you never can get through for sure. But what I do is, you know, my own sort of personal, um, you know, tricks, and I don't even say they're tricks. I mean, just things I use is I, I talk to them as human beings. Like Heidi said, engage with those values that you share and start there. And then when you start there, it seems like you can um, at least make a little bit of progress and listen to them and, and ask them to source. I mean, if they give me something or some fact, then I say, let's look it up. And sometimes they don't like that because that, you know, sometimes we have to sit down and work through the sourcing. But doing that sourcing is just old fashioned fact checking. But I think one piece that I would just say is anytime you see something, whether it's from an uncle or a friend or, or something you see on Facebook or, or, or Twitter, I think one of the things that I, I try to encourage our students when we talk about this in our classes is that don't assume malice when honest mistake can also um, you know, explain it just as well. And so treat them as human beings. Now there are people out there that are truly doing, you know, and, you know, you're intending to mislead and there are people you'll never convince. And I think don't, you know, there is a limit in which you can, you only have so much energy. So maybe focus on those that are at least willing to have the conversation. Yeah, 
No, that sounds fantastic. Those are those are really great insights. And, and actually, you know, uh, Heidi, you mentioned something about asking people about the weather. And one of our one of our uh, attendees, one of our uh, participants online, asked the question: If it helps, and maybe this is what you were getting at, it, does it help to really bring in a person's personal experience when you're having these conversations? In this case, people who you know they're experiencing perhaps changes in the climate, maybe in small incremental doses, or they're seeing things online, like the Australian fires, for instance. Um, does it help then to appeal to a person's personal individual experience or the things they're seeing or reading about in the news as you're trying to engage them in these conversations? Do you think that's part of the discussion? I would simply say yes, I think so. I mean, I think obviously it depends on in part what news you're talking about, but yeah, I think it's always important to contextualize people's lived experiences with these things that are really overwhelming and daunting like climate change. It's really hard to, you know, we, as John just said, you know, behavior and attitude don't necessarily have a sort of linear progression. Um, and ultimately with climate change, we are asking, asking for fundamental changes to all the systems that we rely on in order to, to address this challenge in a way that doesn't completely alter our future. And so understanding what people's current is in their environment and what, they, what their hopes and wishes are for the future, um, that's really important for connecting to this conversation about ultimately asking people to do things differently or to think about the future differently as a consequence of climate change. And that's often why people aren't wanting to engage with the issue or are finding ways to dismiss it is because it's scary and it's, it's potentially altering those very things that we care about. So I would say, yeah, I think it's important to talk about those personal connections. I, I mean, I, I also have to be, think about why I care so much about the issue, right? Yes, it's a career and I care about it fundamentally, but what are the personal things that, that really matter to me that are going to be touched by climate change? And those are numerous, but I also have to do that work um, and be vulnerable in that way and be honest and truthful about that. And so I find that those are, are difficult, but often really rich and rewarding experiences because you're connecting about more than just information and fact. You're connecting as people um, and hopefully creating a shared vision for the future. It may not look identical, but there is likely something in there that you're gonna agree upon um, would be nice for the future. So yeah, I think it's really important. Yeah, was, fantastic. If I could add to that too, Sean, um, so there's uh, research published by my Mason colleagues, Connie Rosa Renouf and Ed Maybach, that found that helping people connect those dots between climate change and extreme events or local weather events uh, is most effective with that, that undecided um, middle uh, group. So, uh, so definitely, yeah, that's, that's a powerful um, strategy. And, and I think the reason why is because it's helping people close that psychological distance one of the reasons why people are less concerned about climate change than really they should be is because there's this, they have this psychological distance. Climate change feels like something that's happening in the Arctic or, or it's going to happen to future generations or it's happening in different parts of the world, not here. And so helping people realise that it's here and now um, closes that psychological distance. And I think that's why um, people are... Uh, have so much less tolerance to misinformation about COVID-19 because there is such a small psychological distance with that threat. Uh, and that's why I, I think seeing it through that lens of psychological distance helps us understand why the public reaction um, has been, it, it's basically like climate change on fast forward. Uh, and so, so that's one interesting way of making parallels between the two issues. And one thing yeah. I just want to add to what John was saying, I'm just curious to see whether perceptions will change at all around climate science after this COVID event. And it may, it may, may, it may be different across different parts of the world, but I, I think you could make an argument in both directions. I think more so for the, maybe the attention people are giving now to science and that big events, big global events can actually happen. So it'll be interesting from, uh, you know, from, a researcher standpoint, or from the world standpoint, actually, for that matter, whether there's any bump in perception. And you have, setting up the experiment on how you test the natural experiment won't be easy, but I'm just curious what others think. If, if we'll get a bump up or we'll get a bump down. 
I'm think I'm if I had to guess and you made me say whether it's a left image or right image or in this case <laughs> up or down, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say at least I'm a I'm an optimist though. So I would say hopefully up a little bit. All right. We can all be optimistic, that's for sure. Um so actually, you know, one of the things that you both brought up, this idea of connecting with people and, and the emotional connection, and that actually brings me to a question that uh, another one of our attendees offered, which I think is a really interesting one, because John, you, you talk about logic versus fact and how introducing logic can actually be really helpful. Uh, you can inoculate your audience in a certain, to a certain extent. Uh, but, but this, this uh, questioner brings up a really good point, which is that, um, you know, I, I, well, at least this person and I, I sort of agree, isn't there a certain amount of evidence that says that we sort of make a lot of our decisions kind of on our gut and on our emotional level? Um, so how do you reconcile those two things? How do we reconcile that we want to use logic, but also people are emotionally connecting and sometimes that's what's affecting what they believe and what they don't believe. So your thoughts. So um, a book I really like is um, Fast and Slow Thinking by Daniel Kahneman. Uh, and he talks about how we do have these two different ways of thinking. Fast thinking or, or um, uh, it's, it's really like our, our gut reaction or our instantaneous or our emotional reaction uh, or way of um, assessing or, or making decisions. And then we have slow thinking, which is just stopping and reasoning through and, and working out diff difficult um, problems or calculations or whatever. And the vast bulk of our thinking is fast thinking. That's just how our brains are hardwired because humans evolve to, um, you know, react to instant uh, immediate threats through fast thinking. So most of our brain is hardwired for that. Uh, and so it's, I've been really struggling with this question. Like I'm trying to build this critical thinking resilient public that are doing slow thinking, but people's brains are not built for that. Uh, they're built for um, you know, much more fast thinking, emotional reactions, heuristics, mental shortcuts. Uh, but Kahneman also talks about this third way of thinking, um, uh, which is expert heuristics. And that's, uh, for example, it's like a surgeon can survey a situation and instantly know what to do, or um, a, a firefighter can walk into a room in a burning building and, and instantly assess, you know, what, what's going to happen or what he needs to do, what action needs to take place. And they develop these expert heuristics or mental shortcuts just through experience and practice. Uh, and so it's basically taking that slow thinking, difficult task and through practice, it becomes a fast thinking mental shortcut. Um, so, what we're exploring right now is this idea of can gamification turn the slow thinking, critical thinking into a fast thinking mental shortcut? Can you, by getting people to practice crit critical thinking in a game over and over and over again, turn that um, difficult task into uh, expert mental shortcut? Um, it's an open question. We're, we're exploring that through the course of this year and hopefully by the end of the year, we'll know. Yeah, that's fascinating, actually. Um, and, well, hey, before John, I, can I just, I just going to say one thing about emotion too. On the study of misinformation, one of the things that we find very often, what pulls people into disinformation, misinformation, or any sort of clickbait that you see online is emotion. So one of the things that we tell people, if you read an article and it incites emotion, that's when you should pause. <laughs> because there's billions and billions of experiments going on right now online through these major large tech platforms that are trying to see what pulls you in, whether it's a headline for a story or whether it's a, uh, you know, a, you know, some of this native advertising that you see at the bottom and the sides of, of all the websites that you play around with. And it's that emotions that these algorithms are sort of tapping into. So just emotion in general, that should give you pause. And we all have res respond strongly to things, but it's when you see that emotion, that's when you almost should pause before believing uh, something that is likely, likely misleading. Yeah, well, Jeff, and the only reason I click on anything on the internet is to find out what Disney character I am most like. So <laughs> that's, that's, what, that's how I choose my clickbait. Hey, I, I click on those things, so I can't, I can't help it. <laughs> yeah, uh, before I go any further, I just wanna make sure that our audience knows that they can still submit some questions at tinyurl.com forward slash questions on tap, all one word. Um, Jevin, this next question is for you. I think it's sort of a, an interesting one. 
when you look at uh, climate misinformation, uh, you mentioned oftentimes in these misinformation campaigns, you see misinformation on both sides. Uh, do, do you have examples or have you seen examples of climate misinformation that are coming from the left that are either coming from entities posing to be from other groups or are truly coming from the left as maybe not even malicious misinformation? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, I haven't seen it as much around misinformation specifically. I know my, some of my colleagues have seen it. It's a general pattern that we see often um, as a way of just sort of blasting with a fire hose mutually conflicting information. So even if on the left, you might not necessarily see sort of an uplifting of the current conversation or sort of agitation, but just sort of mutually conflicting information that they might think is coming from maybe the other side. It, it, it's almost this idea of just sort of creating rifts between different groups as much as possible. It's an interesting one though, because in that case, you know, there, there tends to be, um, it's, you know, it's not, it's not like a social, it's a, the, some of the social movements like the Black Lives Matter and, and related movements, there, there typically is more of a, you know, a rift in between the groups, not that there's not a rift in, in misinformation research. But I think in this case, what we would more often see is this agnotology, um, uh, well, it's, this, it's the study of, of sort of doubt inducement, but it's this idea that science is actually weaponized against itself. Um, and so what can get infiltrated maybe into, let's say the left circles in this case, are using science itself, which people, those that tr entrust and have, you know, and sort of subscribe to a lot of the methodologies and approaches of science would, would say, you know, they, they use that to say, well, you believe in uncertainty, right? Um, you sort of, you, you know, you subscribe to this uncertainty. Well, we don't know necessarily for sure that smoking causes cancer um, because it, you know, it has, you know, we've not shown these, these, you know, we haven't set up the methods like you sort of propose. And there's sort of these, these ways of inducing and sort of buying time. It's almost like, it's a terrible version of flattening the curve, I guess, because you're buying time. These, let's say a company, a tobacco company would want to buy time so that there's, you know, for regulatory um, uh, control over what they're doing um, in ways that are, not to sort of mangle the, the, the metaphor of the flattening the curve idea, but the idea is just to buy time through doubt. Um, and so I, I guess, you know, that's, it's not a great answer to that great, interesting question about, well, in that case, in climate change, do you see, sort of these, you know, let's say IRA accounts, it's not IRA, it could be lots of different groups sort of agitating more. I think what you'd see there, I mean, and again, I'm not an expert, I'm just, it's making me think out loud that, that maybe you would see agitation. You'd see the sort of agitation um, uh, kind of strategies being used in both the left and right, um, just to agitate and sort of provide uh, links showing how, 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 how dumb or, or how crazy the other group is on the other side of the political spectrum when in fact, many of them may don't even subscribe to it. So it could be, it could be that agitation. I don't know, it's a great question. Mm. Can I um, yeah. add, add a little something, Sean? Yeah, of course. So when we Your were- panel. <laughs> <laughs> when we were developing our, um, our MOOC about climate science denial, um, there was a push for it to be providing both sides. So, you know, you're debunking denialist myths, but shouldn't you, you be debunking alarmist myths as well? Like, cases where scientists exaggerate um, the, the risk from climate change. And there's actually literature on, on the relative occurrences of, of do, when scientists exaggerate versus downplay or, or, or underestimate climate impacts. And scientists, climate scientists in the literature are actually 20 times more likely to underestimate or downplay climate impacts rather than um, rather than exaggerate it. And there's some really interesting research by Stefan Lewandowski that explores psychologically why that's the case. Um, but uh, we ended up saying, well, okay, well, to be properly balanced then, for every 20 denier myths, we'll, we'll debunk one exaggeration myth. And, and so, um, yeah, I think that it's, it's false equivalence to say that there's equal misinformation going in both directions. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Um, one, one last question that I thought was, uh, was very interesting. Um, and this actually m might be a, a good one for you, John. Um, do you see any correlation in the data? And make, actually, Jevin and, and Heidi, you can chime in on this one too. Is there any correlation sort of demographics in terms of um, 
resilience to misinformation uh, do you see? I mean, is, is it uh, you can't teach an old dog new tricks or uh, young and gullible? Uh, you know, is, is there anything like that? And, and actually, I'm kind of curious from Jevin or from Heidi, if you have any thoughts on that topic, too. So uh, in my research, what I found was that the biggest predictor in vulnerability to misinformation um, without considering inoculations was political ideology. So the more politically conservative people were, the more vulnerable or influenced they were about misinformation, about climate change, right? about that specific topic. I'm not talking about all types of misinformation. And so, um, but the interesting thing I found was it, when you explained the techniques used to mislead um, in a general way, not uh, in a climate context, but just saying here is this technique of fake experts, here is an example of it being applied by the tobacco industry in the 50s. Um, inoculating people in a general way like that, um, uh, neutralizing misinformation across the political spectrum. So it, it basically uh, take, it, it uh, removes that polarizing influence of misinformation. So um, that's, I'm not answering the question about demographics terribly well, but that's one element. I'll just say a couple of things and then I'll turn it over to Heidi. Um, the, in misinformation more generally, there's been mixed results. Um, so Josh Tucker at NYU produced a, a paper that spread you know, massively because of the result. And what they found is that misinformation, at least online, uh, that some of the uh, you know, older people were vulnerable. But that was counter to other results that showed young people, like Bruce Weinberg at Stanford has shown that young people are, are highly, un, are, are don't have the sort of critical thinking that maybe the older generation. So I think at this point, there's a lot of research, at least around misinformation generally. Climate science, I think, is a different thing. And John had pointed to that. And I think it's, it's, it makes it easier when you can drill down on a specific topic like climate change. But one thing, the one, the, the one group that I think is doing really interesting work around this is David Rand. Um, he's at MIT. So anyone interested in reading some of his work where he's looked at motivated reasoning, he's like, the motivated reasoning is this idea that if you sort of are motivated to get to some narrative, that you, that you sort of use your own, <laughs> your critical thinking skills to get you to whatever narrative you want. And he's actually shown that that's not necessarily the case, he kind of finds that people are just kind of lazy reasoners. If you get, whether it's a Republican or a Democrat, you know, people on the left, left, left or right, they can come to similar conclusions and even source things similarly. They'll say, yeah, I admit there's some bias in this news on in my side and there's some bias on that side, but they kind of converge a little bit more than we'd expect. So here's, the, here's sort of my take on it. It's a little mixed right now. And I think there's a lot of research that's being done right now and that needs to be done to, to determine whether there are certain demographics that are more vulnerable. The one, the one group that I think, if you could say, was certainly vulnerable are those just coming online for the first time. And that, that's in a lot of developing countries, but still in the United States, there are people that are coming online, at least broadband-wise, for the first time ever. And, and though that group in particular tends to be a little bit more vulnerable to misinformation. I mean, Edgar Welch, who was the person that went shooting into Pizzagate, the, the, the pizzeria in Washington, D.C., had just you know, come online. And so I think that group you could identify as possibly more vulnerable. But again, you know, it, it, it's difficult to come to this, but it's a, another interesting question. Yeah. Heidi, you have final thoughts? Yeah. I mean, I think maybe this is a, I, I guess just a, to, to dovetail on, on that is thinking about where different people are getting information. So when we think, and I think there's a lot of research that we still need to do and a lot of critical thinking we need to do about not only um, which de demographics are vulnerable, but um, how different demographics are getting information and different communities get access to the type of information that's produced. And so um, I think about that when um, sort of in our, in our work, I'll give you a concrete example, um, thinking about um, say fire prevention and preparedness. Um, we try to um, prevent people from being vulnerable to wildfire and wildfire smoke, which is an experience that we had here in the Pacific Northwest two summers ago was um, terrible. Um, but thinking about how we communicate um, and how people actually get access to information um, is important for also thinking about who is vulnerable to information when we think about these specific topic areas. So um, as researchers, are we studying in all the places where it matters? Um, and also just as communicators and people, members of communities, um, is information 
accessible and what types of information can be shared and communicated. Some communities and demographics say listen to radio. Um, and so I, I think about this a lot actually um, with King County, thinking about how is it that they distribute information about climate change and climate impacts. Um, different groups read print. Um, some people aren't online, um, as Jevin pointed out. And so I think it's this really rich um, ecosystem we live in where information um, can move around more quickly than it ever has been before. But I think there's also places where information moves in traditional ways that um, maybe we're not thinking about as much and maybe need to put some more attention on um, so that there is more access and equitable access to information, particularly as, as climate change comes to the fore and people's lives are in some cases immediately threatened um, and they maybe don't have the same amount of access to information about protecting themselves, for example. Um, so I think we've got lots to do in the research space, but also um, have a lot of responsibility as members of communities to make sure that people have access to the information that they need. And that is coming to light as we all live together through a pandemic. We're facing similar information equity issues. Exactly. Well, on that note, I, um, I just want to take one second to, um, to thank you all, Let's see if I just popped open, to thank you all um, for a great conversation. I have really enjoyed uh, hearing from you all, and I could honestly spend the next hour talking to you, but I want to respect your time and the, the time of the participants online as well, and uh, just leave you with a couple of thoughts. First of all, uh, if you've enjoyed tonight's presentation, please check out CascadiaClimateAction.org and sign up for the newsletter so that you can learn more about these events coming into the future. Uh, as I said, once, uh, once we're back uh, in person, we hope to do more of these around the city of Seattle. And who knows, this has been so successful, maybe we'll continue to do these online as well so more people can take advantage. Um, I do wanna just give a special thank you to John Cook, Heidi Roop and Jevin West for being with us tonight. It was fantastic to speak with all of you and I think that our audience learned a lot too. I wanna be, I wanna uh, give a shout out to the breweries that we typically work with, Optimism Brewing, Flying Bike and Peddlers. And I believe Flying Bike and Peddlers are doing a discount for people who got tickets. So please check that out. I wanna thank Darcy Widmeyer for her help or tech help tonight. And I wanna give a shout out to Cascadia Climate Action in particular Mary Menos and Amelia Jones. So everyone at home, stay home and stay safe, and we'll see you at the next Climate Science on Tap. Y'all have a great evening. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.